lots of fantastic books out there from um, you know, uh, from PMI, Agile Business Consortium in particular, around Agile Project and Program and Portfolio Management. But even they focus mostly on IT enabled stuff. And I just wanted to get away from that and say, let's look and see what any project might look like if you apply agility to it. And to my mind then, once you've done that, you can say, ah, oh, you can use that as a model for building an organization that's friendly to projects. Other models are available, but here's one. Yeah. And I think it works. Well, I hope you enjoyed that first part of that interview with uh, Adrian. And uh, he'll be back next week. So have a great week and speak soon. Bye. Some of you uh, will have been long-term listeners and will be aware that I've started this podcast on a product called Anchor. So when I started, um, I was working out how do I do it? What do I need to do to get a podcast out? There are all these different things. How do I actually get it out into different podcasting areas? And um, how do I potentially make some money out of, out of podcasting? Um, and I discovered Anchor. And the answer to every one of my questions really was simple, and it was Anchor. Anchor provides a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distribution your pod, your podcast if you're interested in doing one. Best of all, it's free. It's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. I can do it on my phone. I can do it on the laptop. It's, it's fab. Um, and now um, Anchor can match with great sponsors who can advertise on the podcast and hopefully uh, support and pay for some of the stuff that's going on. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's what I'm doing by reading this ad. Um, Anchor will pay me um, for doing this advert. Uh, so the way I use ad Anchor and a recent thing that I've started to experiment with is using the um, contributor section where someone rings in and leaves a message. Um, you'll have heard earlier on maybe one of my podcast people's uh, um, contributions and questions and queries and thanks. So it's a great way of using it, really. Um, I, over the time, I've recorded directly into the app. I've recorded and uploaded. I've recorded on my phone and uh, uploaded at the same time. So it's really flexible. It's for you to do it when you want, where you want, and however you want. So if you've wanted to start a podcast um, and, and make some money out of it, why not go to anchor.fm slash start. That's anchor.fm slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already using it. Okay, can't wait to hear it. So what's been going on last week or so, or a couple of weeks? Um, busy old time as usual, managed to get a bit of uh, moving around, but I think a highlight of the week so far, or the fortnight, has been the message that I'm just about to play you now. Thank you so much, Nigel. This is Naveen from India. Your efforts are highly helpful for uh, project managers throughout the world. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, uh, Naveen, for that message. Um, it's always good to hear from people. Um, when they're listening to the show to find out that you're finding of use uh, and and of interest and if anyone else wants to do it there's a the, if you jump onto the anchor uh, site or through the anchor feed you can uh, leave me a message and um, I will play it on the show as long as it's not too offensive um, or if you've got questions or queries or thoughts or just anything really just drop me a little message um, and uh, we'll see maybe start the conversation a little bit more two-way going forward. Um, I've had a few interviews that I've been uh, working through this last few weeks. A few have fallen through and a few have happened. Um, so it's really good. Uh, the ones I have got nailed in um, will be out fairly soon. Um, just get them all uh, tidied up. 
Um, we've got enough shows. We've got a couple. We've got Drew Jennison coming up um, uh, later on in the year. Mike Schlegel as well. Uh, and then kicking off next year with uh, Gregory Offner and Lucy Harrison. Um, and those are the ones that are in the bag at the moment. Um, so um, keep an eye out for when those pop into your subscription. Um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of everything that's really important that's been going on from my perspective. And I think I'm just going to let you get on and have a listen to Adrian Pine and my conversation with him about being agile and not just with an IT project. Have fun. Bye. So today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Adrian Pine to the show. Um, Adrian is the author of this book, Agile Beyond IT. Sorry, I've got it too close to me screen. There we go. Um, it says on the back of it, so I'll, I'll, it must be true. Uh, he's a project professional for over 30 years, uh, has led changes in 11, 11 industries in the, and in the public sector in the UK and abroad. The author of books on program management and agile governance and insurance. Assurance, sorry, he has con- contributed to the evolution of program, portfolio, and PMO standards, and is a regular speaker, visiting lecturer, blogger, and researcher. Welcome to the show, Adrian. Thank you very much. What a what a glowing tribute. There. I could have yeah. written it myself. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it does. It, you, I doubt you could have done better yourself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's uh, uh, it's it's amazing how these bios are really good for people. And, and as you say, it's printed on the back of a book, so it must be true. Tell us a little bit, a, a little bit more about you. Uh, beyond that, where you're from? People will probably guess from your accent where you're from, but uh, well, yeah, from yeah, a country, most, from a country uh, point of view. From a country point of view, yeah, I'm from England. Uh, I grew up in on the edge of South East London, or as it probably should have been, uh, South East London. Uh, but I think my parents <laughs> made sure. My brother and I never spoke like that, um, so you know, there we go. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, these days though, I live in uh, uh, Dorset, uh, in a very nice little village, um, beautiful uh, in, in West Dorset. So, which is uh, uh, really really nice. Um, uh, there with my partner of uh, nearly thirty one years, who's a retired uh, architect, and both he and I love gardening. So, so we we got a very big garden and a bit of a field and planted a few hundred trees uh, over the last sort of 10, 11 years. Um, and we've got loads of fantastic walks and we like going off on holidays to sort of do, do walking into the Wales or uh, um, uh, you know, various other places around, around the UK. I think both of us not doing, COVID or no, not doing great deal in terms of foreign travel because both of us have spent quite a lot of our professional lives traveling uh, in various places uh, uh, around the world. Um, uh, so my, my partner's built buildings in sort of Saudi Arabia to bits of Europe and all over the UK and I've worked in various places around the world and states and, and everything. So, you know, these, these days we, um, we prefer to, at least at the moment, staying a bit closer to, uh, to home and uh, love, love touring around uh, the UK. Well, it's a... I live. I'm very fortunate. I live just on the Welsh border, up on the north, the north of Wales in Shropshire. And uh, oh, as you say, yeah. you, you you go it. You, for me, it's an hour's drive to go to different parts of Wales. It's astounding where you live down there in that area. It's astounding. And and this country has has got so much uh, to uh, to to give, especially if you want to go outdoors and stuff. It's just an astounding place. And it's funny when you say that about the the travelling and stuff. I remember. I've not been a very much of an international traveller, but I remember a similar sort of thing that when I was working for Oracle a few years back where I was a consultant project manager, so I was travelling a lot. Um, most days I was away or staying in London, staying in hotels and doing that sort of thing. And then I, I'd kind of go away with my, my other half and we'd go to a hotel for a weekend and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't want another frigging Caesar salad, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying. I, I do. Yeah. Um, I do like a Caesar of, salad. You are. We were actually we were actually just outside Oswald Street only about uh, two three weeks ago. Uh, so and, that's uh, that's where I live. Store. There you go. So do you know the uh, Penedifrin? Uh, yeah, the Penedifrin. Yeah, yeah. Penny Dufferin, yes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah been there. I can't remember uh, whose really birthday. Fantastic walking. Yeah. Yeah, 
Well, I live in a little village called Pant, which is on its way out into Wales. So you're heading out towards Welshpool along the A483. So yeah, you were, you were literally in spitting distance from my house then. There you go. Well, that's good. I, lo- I love this area. Born and bred here and I stay here. So oh, yeah. Right. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, so I, start, I started out, um, you know, one of the first, I guess, bits of business travel I ever had to do, because I started out in BT uh, back in 86. Um, yeah. And in the very, very early days of quite primitive networks, I was, and I started out in IT and BT, and I had to come up to, BT had a big and slightly secret place in Oswald Street, had a control centre in Oswald yeah. Street. And, yeah, um, a, so park hall, had, a park hall, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And it had some subterranean levels, which were, uh, at least I was told whether it's true or not, because it's, it's no longer there. Um, it, the, it was sort of a control, emergency control center if the bomb ever dropped. So, um, yeah. because, because I know there, there were sort of buttons on the, on the lift that you, that you had to have a lock and a code in order to be able to operate. Wow. But I know they never let me down there. Sensible people. You're sure it just wasn't fancy toilets or anything like that? I, I don't know. I mean, they could have been just pulling pulling my leg, but they were, I think they're about four minus four levels. I was like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't surprise me because obviously Park Hall Camp there. And it's, we're going back at history of Oswald Street. Then this would change this podcast too. Now, um, Park Hall Camp, where uh, that building was, was uh, an army barracks for many many years. Military army barracks. Uh, my dad was based there and ended up be staying around this area so back in the second world war so uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there and then when you look over towards welshpool towards Criggan, there was a radio telescope that's uh, not a radio telescope a radio antenna that was for the polaris submarines was either oh, either redundancy or the major communication so uh, it, it makes sense that you might have some of that stuff in and around the uh, the area that, uh, yeah. yeah so for anyone who wants to come to Shropshire you can uh, it's a lovely place <laughs> and also is yeah. amazing as well so yeah so we're not going to talk about that yeah we're, we're not going to talk about it. it's been interesting though that um, uh, working with BT because obviously um, IT within BT and and our conversation today a bit off the back of your book but actually I kind of want to go back a little bit before that a little bit and say and here's a question. I hope I hope it won't be too bad. Agile is a emotive subject. Um, in in many fields, um, it, it's 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 the one topic that when I look on um, LinkedIn, I can see quite a few diverse opinions, um, and I, I have some joy watching them sometimes, and occasionally chip in what I think. Um, not that I'm utterly qualified for it but I have an opinion so so let's start with what I think is probably a key thing what is agile I'm I'm kind of with another Adrian on this one first of all um, I, I prefer to try and use the word agility rather than rather than agile because mm-hmm. um, uh, that and, and it's not just a bit of semantics it's it's trying to get away from the almost religious discussion that and attitudes that some people have around agile with a big A. And some yeah. folk, um, especially from a kind of an IT background, can get rather protective of agile and say, you can't, you know, it, it came, out of, came out of software, agile manifesto, can't do anything else with it. Um, and if you try and do it, you're a heretic and we should burn you at the stake and stuff and uh and then there's other folk that have say i take agile and they say i'm being agile in my organization and 10 or 11 12 years ago i started saying well what do you mean because I, I i get the agile manifesto and which yeah. which i personally think is the most coherent definition or description of what agility means and yeah, you can kind of boil it down into being, it means flexibility and it means doing just enough of something. Um, and, and as in fact, I wrote in response to a bit of a, uh, someone's blog today, and I was, I was agreeing with something they, they were saying, I said, just enough doesn't mean leaving stuff out. It means you do just yeah. enough. 
it's like um, I well great tennis players people you know from uh, in the kind of era that I used to sort of still playing a bit of tennis sort of Bjorn Borg or the great players of today in Nadal they don't move around the tennis court any more than they need to their job is to make the other person move around um, and stuff and so you know so they don't they don't play more tennis than they absolutely have to and to me that's kind of when I started looking at the Agile Manifesto years ago, and I thought to myself, well, hang on a second, if I take away the, the pure IT bit of this, or take it out of an IT context, this describes how I work. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always focusing on value, and most great project professionals focus on value, uh, which is, I've got to say, it's different from when I started out in projects back in the 80s back in sort of the uh, latish 80s. Um, and then all the training courses said, projects are about producing stuff. You do stuff with them. You start in, and uh, it has the usual sort of time cost quality, however you want to define the, the three parameters. Yeah. But they're there to produce stuff. And that never sat right with me way, way back then. And I thought, well, hang on a second. Well, you know, yes, projects produce stuff, but why do they produce stuff? And the answer is that to actually get some benefit out of it, uh, and so yeah. and that's where I started coming from. When I was when I when I first put to uh, was in the mid '90s, and I was starting to work as a as a, as a consultant um, and putting together project management capabilities in organisations. I started from the standpoint of why are we doing projects, and what do we need to get out of the projects, and that's how we measure whether a project is successful or not is it delivering some kind of benefit is it delivering some kind of value so the whole value basis of agility which is absolutely at its core um you know is is great for me it's not new i you know i again it's another reason why i like to use the word agility because agility has been with us an awful long time i recognize not just myself but a lot of other professionals of my advanced age um sort of around you know retirement and gone retirement as as having exhibited agility for decades um yeah. even before someone wrote down and said what agility actually looked for so way way before 2001 um and and so it's been with us a long time it just so happens that uh, a group of amazing people sat down um and came up with the agile manifesto and then you can take the Ag agile manifesto which was absolutely about developing software and i realized again 10 11 12 years ago well actually you can you can take this and you can apply it in other areas which lots of people have done and it's been applied in in marketing and engineering product development um in uh, you know well beyond the software and of, uh, even construction and of course project management i've even seen and written a report about uh, an agile nuclear engineering program or put it another way a nuclear engineering program that was done in an agile way and they didn't know it at the time they said come and do a review of this program and i, I did and i said do you realize how you've gone about running this and the freedom you've been given to come up with the solutions some really tricky technical solutions to a huge engineering nuclear engineering problem that they were dealing with uh, and they, uh, they they were the only people in the world who could actually tackle that problem so they were given the authority to actually come up with solutions with people looking over their shoulder but that's fine but not people on their shoulder and on their back yeah. all the time it was it was a classic piece of agile behavior not just in the team but from the organizational landscape and the um, uh, around them and, you know, and i talk to people and i say oh yeah agile nuclear engineering and they go no 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 you, you cannot possibly do nuclear engineering agile what there you go there's one so yeah um, it's funny because there's a rambling answer for you yeah so what so no, what is agility? It's... Focus on value, flexibility, and doing just enough. Yeah. That's, That's which, which, it down. which is yeah. yeah, which is really easy to think about, isn't it? 
and hmm. and I, I think the um, pseudo religious behaviors of of some or, or so maybe it's not the behaviors it's some of the things that um, and I I might have been a little bit guilty having done a scrum master course of doing getting really annoyed with people who are saying we're agile and then I sit there going but you're not doing this and you're not doing that so therefore you are not and it kind of in recent months or years I've kind of sat there and gone well actually isn't that you've got those core fundamentals that you're talking about there and actually the tools that you use or the, the methodology in quotes um, that you use I suppose the thing is it's like scrum if you're not doing stand-ups are you doing scrum well you can still be agile but not be doing and it's about using those um tools to support it in a way that suits what you need and being agile in how you use those tools and it's kind of it, it, it's kind of sit there and go right we're using a kanban board brilliant super right it's not working for us because we've done a retrospective we've worked out that using that kanban board isn't working because what we're trying to do at the moment doesn't lend itself we haven't got we've we haven't broken it down to enough tasks for us to build it. So how do we do it differently? But that doesn't necessarily mean you're not using agility to do that. In fact, you're using agility to re-engineer that, I think. And I, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I've seen it with... I've tried to use... What I describe is not being agile, but where I've, I've seen things where people put things, oh, we're going to deliver this in an agile framework yeah. with capital A. And I've kind of changed it, say, no, we're going to use agile methodologies or agile techniques to deliver it which is what's mm. really happening in, in, from what I'm seeing in there and it's kind of but again even then sometimes I'm being a bit picky and pedantic because as you, it's I suppose it's the capital and the little a which is the mm. the bit that draws the question I'm not so sure you are being sort of picky and pedantic because you know it is a, it is a kind of key question can you be a bit agile um, and I mean, the simple answer is yes. And I've seen loads of examples of projects and, or, well, sometimes not projects, sometimes just software developments, or sometimes projects, sometimes other things, um, where they say, you know, we're using agility. And I'm thinking, when I want to look at how they're working and I'm thinking, well, you're using a bit of agility. And yeah. The answer is, yeah, you can get some value out of that. But the whole point is, um, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the whole of the, uh, the, the set of the Agile principles, for the Agile Manifesto and the four values, is that you get the value, you get the highest and greatest value out of applying all of those values and all of those principles. Um, and, and Another thing which I've seen, which is also probably true, there probably is a tipping point where you're not being enough agile to get any value at all. And in fact, you start, you start getting anti-agile. And I've, yeah. I've certainly taken part in a lot of, I don't know, shall we say blog discussions where people say, oh, you've got anti-patterns going on, anti-agile going on. And that is tr and, and and that is and that is true. Uh, when, when someone says, um, I, I guess the best example of uh, of that, or most common, I think I've seen, is where teams are trying to do agility inside a team, inside a project, and everything in the organisational landscape around it is killing it. Um, so, an agile team is supposed to basically have all the people in the team it needs the right subject matter experts, the right technical people, da 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 If you simply are, have got a team where the organization is refusing to give the right, um, the, the, the subject matter experts, for example, with the right capability, uh, and even if it does, not empowering those to make the decision, even though they've got all the knowledge and experience they need, then you're killing the agility because the whole point of agility is to do things faster and deliver value faster. That's really what it kind of boils down to. The idea is, uh, you know, it's it, you can still in in lots of other techniques with waterfall software development approaches, you can still de deliver value. Can you deliver it faster? And the big attraction 
that, um, in fact, I think it says so on the Agile Manifesto pages, is that we're about delivering working software faster. I think that's one of the key, one of the big, big drivers yeah. for them. Uh, and so if you do it properly, you can, you can potentially get that, get that benefit uh, probably more often than, than, than not. So there does come a point where if someone's being only a bit agile, um, then in the areas that they're not being a bit agile, how damaging, how anti-agile are those areas? And it kind of brings me into another area which I recognize around projects. Now, I, something I, I, that, that I kind of observed probably 25 years ago is, uh, and it's something which, which actually still only very recently has been reflected in what people would call good practice or best practice. So writings by the PMI, APM and the like. Um, yeah. And that is that projects, projects have always been written about as being successful because of what goes on inside the project or the program or the portfolio. And that is of course true. But there's another dimension, and that is the organizational environment, the hinterland around a project. Uh, and again, it's an example like I just, I just gave. If you, I mean, I, the number of times as a project professional myself, I've had to go battling to get resources that have been promised when the project's in mobilization and they just never materialize, or people who are just not experienced enough. Uh, or simply not getting, although the funding is promised, it, that never materializes, or it's not enough, or it gets slowed down. And half the time, a project manager can find themselves battling against the organization to keep their project alive, let alone successful. So you've got a two dimensional thing here. On the one hand, projects are successful or not because of what goes on inside them and the effectiveness of the team, its leadership, etc. But also the environment around the project, its hinterland, is the other is the other dimension. And unfortunately, in most organizations, projects are like viruses. Um, they're they're packed on, they're not business as usual. And yeah. Because of that very nature, they're not business as usual, so they don't get the attention. Um, part of that is, and you know, we could be opening up massive cans of worms here, but I'll, but I'll say why it's particularly important for for, for agility, is because at board level, most people on boards don't get projects because they don't come from a projects background. They come from a BAU background. They are accountants, they're lawyers, they're engineers, they're techie people, they're whatever they marketing people, whatever they happen to be. And there's nothing wrong with that or their experience whatsoever. But in these days of increasing projectization and PMI have written and produced huge evidence um, yeah. uh, uh, about the increasing projectization of work, projects are moving more and more into the operation. They're moving more and more into the business as usual. If you've got leadership at the top of the organization that doesn't understand 50% of what it's of what the organization does, that's a recipe for waste, for a huge amount of wasted investment. So yeah, why that's it, important. It, it, you know, go on, carry on. I was going to say, it, it boils to that as a project manager that's always sat there, that project sponsorship, that project support for each project and, and proper project sponsorship. Because one of the things I've read before now is around having sponsors, when you have a project sponsor, and I, I, I didn't get a chance to put it about one bit of advice to give a project sponsor on uh, Jonathan Norman's uh, Opina the other day would have been, I was gonna do it and I forgot to register, but the, the, the the, the thought I had was actually get trained in understanding projects as a project sponsor so you understand where your role fits and how you fit in with that project manager. And as you say, those BAU people, understanding what's expected of them, understanding what and being available for that project manager is, is a bit that 
as you say, that causes these a massive. Again, it, it kind of rings me back to I've been reading Tammy Watchorn's book, one of your your fellow uh, stable authors, and and just the things is it, she talks about getting stuff done despite the organisation really in her book <laughs> from the way I'm reading it, and and I think that is is what we do find ourselves sometimes, isn't it? It's because you know this is the right thing to do, you know it needs to be done, and everyone wants you to do it, but no one's acting as if they do, and it just that sponsorship real sponsorship not i'm the sro i'm the project sponsor yes i'm the one who signs the checks and then that's it there's so much more that's needed from them absolutely and quite often project professionals will find themselves negotiating with the uh senior manager who is the project sponsor who is the sro for how much of their time they're going to have um, interestingly enough, several years ago, I was asked to go and do some work with the uh, top management team of a particular business school. And they said, mm. we're having problems because all of us in the top management team, we are, we are all sponsors for particular change projects uh, in and around the, uh, uh, the business school. And we're challenged in that role. Um, and so I went in and did some discussion with them collectively and individuals. And it soon became clear that not surprisingly, as very senior people in a, in a very good business school, they knew exactly up there what an SRO role was about, a sponsorship role was about. They absolutely got that. They absolutely understood that. What they didn't have was the time to do it because they had yeah. incredibly busy day jobs. So actually we turned it round and the piece of work I did with them was working out, not for, if you like, that financial year, because they were just on a, on a treadmill and couldn't change it. It says, right, for the, for the future years, this, let's work out a way that gives you collectively and individually the space to do your, let's say, business as usual roles and your projects and your project facing roles. And that's what that piece of work ended up all about. And um, it, that apparently seemed to seem to work very, very well, uh, certainly the next year. And, and, uh, and after that, I, I wasn't involved any anymore. So seem seemed to seem to be OK. And uh, so, so, they ha so they had to actually find a way of changing their almost their business as usual um, because they were having to speak. You know, they, it, they could no longer tenably have projects as some something they fit in fitted into five minutes a day which was crazy thing to do but far too uh, important to the business school so they actually had to be somehow fitted into the opera let's not call it the business as usual let's call it the operation so projects as part yeah. of the operation and that's increasingly where i'm from these days yeah, because it's interesting because I, I recently did a, a bit of refresher training on strategy and it's something I've been looking at and, and, and as, as an area that I need to, because I've always thought that I do think ahead and in my role I try to look beyond the next delivery sort of thing and, and generally managing teams of people. And it, it makes me wonder whether actually you've got, strategy which is these leaders in those organizations that's where you really want them spending a lot of their time thinking about the way they're in the future for their particular area of expertise those lawyers those accountants those marketing people and then the next part of their role is is as you say is the operations actually keeping things going but the bit that sits in the middle that takes us from strategy and then puts it into operation is projects isn't it projects is the realization of the strategy into the operational environment mm -hmm. well it's 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 what projects if you in the modern kind of era were invented for um yeah. and that is and it's also why program management evolved uh, really in the early 1990s because the size and complexity and the frequency of change was increasing and increasing and increasing and project management couldn't cope 
it sim you know, can yeah. cope with the complexity uh, of stuff that was being thrown in its direction, which is why program management uh, evolved. And then the sheer frequency and numbers of change initiatives, you then had to gather those together, which is which is which is which is really where portfolio where portfolio management uh, emerged. Um, and, yeah. and I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, back in the day with the late and much lamented or missed guru of program management, Jeff Reese. Um, he led ProgM, which was APM's uh, program management SIG. And for many years, as well as program management, because these all these other ideas were floating around, uh, ProgM um, flew the flag for portfolio management and uh, PMO, uh, the development of understanding of PMOs within APM, until other people came along and said, we need to we need to actually you know develop this much much further and they took it on and there were separate SIGs and which is yeah. fantastic that's exactly what needed uh, uh, to happen so but you had that clear evolution path in response to what was happening but now we've got this thing where as i say you, you've got projects increasingly moving into the operation and that's different from what I saw happening 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and that has absolutely far more impact on an organization than, uh, shall we say, change projects and programs, you know, which, mm. which have arguably been peripheral uh, for, for many, many years, um, if, not, if, not, if not decades. Um, so given that, and that's another thing which piqued my interest in, in agility, because I started to see that because agility is 50% agile, 50% uh, uh, behavioral and or roughly, it's hard, you know, it's as much behavioral as it is process. Um, yeah. And that again is pretty much un unlike anything any, any other aspect of, uh, of, of um, method that I've, I've used over over the years. In fact, um, people the people side of project management didn't even really start to emerge until well into the 1990s uh, with, with the APM body of knowledge. You didn't get much in the way of the behavioral stuff in, in PMI bodies of knowledge until the 2000s and, and stuff. But, you know, PMI, on the ball these days, far far more with with yeah. with, with that stuff, uh, and the leading in many ways. Um, but the, but it but it wasn't it wasn't there then, and so with the organisational um, dimension of it, rec um, which which PMI have written a lot about and researched a lot about, and APM as well, um, you you've got to say well okay so how do you create an organisation? that is supportive of projects and to me agility is a model for that because it's got all the principles and the values for that it's got the behavioral stuff it's got the process the process side of it it's got all those principles and values already built in all you what you what needed to happen and this is why what drove me to read to write the book really was nobody to my mind had really stepped back and said, let's, let's forget about IT projects, forget about IT. What does agility itself look like when applied to the whole of project management, not just inside a project, but also the organizational side of it, or sitting, sitting around the project? How do you make projects thrive? And that's and that to me was the key differentiator. Lots of fantastic books out there from, um, you know, uh, from PMI Agile Business Consortium in particular around agile project and program and portfolio management. But even they focus mostly on IT enabled stuff. And I just wanted to get away from that and say, let's look and see what any project might look like if you apply agility to it and to my mind then once you've done that you can say ah oh, 
you can use that as a model for building an organization that's friendly to projects. Other models are available, but here's one, yeah. and I think it works. Hi, and welcome to the Sunday Lunch Project Manager podcast for Sunday, the 13th of November, 2022. This is your host, Nigel Creaser, and today I meet Adrian Pine, the Agile Beyond IT guy. Speak to you soon. Wow, you made it this far. I'm guessing that you enjoyed the show if you have, or maybe you've just left it playing in the background and forgot it was on. But if you did enjoy it and uh, you're inclined to, I'd be delighted if you could share your, the show with your colleagues. Uh, it's a discoverability with podcasts is quite difficult, especially with a niche one like this. But sharing with your colleagues and letting them have a chance to listen to these fantastic guests would be brilliant. If you've got time, a review on whatever platform you uh, listen to it on uh, would be great too, especially if it was a five-star one. Again, that makes it easier for people to discover the show when they're searching on there because the comments uh, raise it up the old search engine ops and optimization on all the different tools. If you are feeling flush, I have a couple of ways you could uh, contribute. One is Patreon, uh, Patreon slash Sunday Lunch PM, and you can uh, uh, donate some money to the to the podcast that way. Uh, or you can jump along to my my um, website, nigelcreaser.com, www.nigelcreaser.com, and click on the link to the shop. And in there, you've got all my books that I've created uh, in the varying different guises, a number of different ways you can grab a copy of those. And down the bottom, I've got the uh, well, my guests' books. So everyone who's been on here, if they've had a book, I've got a link to their their. Uh, their book in there and Amazon give me a little bit back for when someone buys from them but uh, more importantly uh, if you come back next time and listen um, I'll be delighted so I'll leave you alone and let you get on with your day now thank you bye <laughs>